Well, I hope you guys are doing well tonight. It's always a weird thing to, to have one of these greetings because like, good evening sounds really weird to me. Like, good evening, you know, like much more, much more fancy than I am. So I'll just say, I hope you guys are doing well tonight and, uh, and get into it. So I will go ahead and pray us in and we will get started. Dear God, I'm so thankful for everything that you're doing in all of us here. So thankful that, uh, that you've allowed all of us to gather here and uh, come to get to know you better. I pray that you would bless the reading of, uh, of your word. I pray you'd open all of our hearts to be able to receive what you're doing in us tonight and, uh, and going throughout this week. So we're thankful for everything you do for us. In Jesus' name, amen. So, uh, yeah, I've kind of got, got three points that I, that I wanted to cover tonight. And, and so the first point is going to be God has a specific way of doing things. The second point is going to be God has a will for our lives, uh, or God decides his will for our lives, not us. And the third point of God resides only in his will and his way. And so kind of on the, on the topic of, of kind of God's will for, for things, when I was all growing up, I was a, I mean, a co- complete pyro, still am, um, always burning things down, sometimes on accident, sometimes on purpose, always making mistakes. You know, I, I actually burned my family's shed down. When I was about 15, um, that was a that was a big deal. Uh, almost burned my neighbor's house down. Almost burned my house down. I was always playing with fire. Always making making fire. You know, there was this wasn't the this was just the biggest thing that I burned down. That was not the only thing that I burned down. And so, um, I'm having a, a a fire with. I'm probably 15. All my buddies are are over, and my mom comes out about midnight and says, "Hey, it's time to put the fire out." So I wanted to use the logs for the next day. So obviously I'm not going to just soak them all. I need to use them for the next day. So I pull all the logs out. It's a wise 15 year old decision. And so I soak all the logs out with the, uh, with the, the water hose. So I think, and about five o'clock in the morning, my neighbor is somehow in my room saying the backyard's on fire, the backyard's on fire. So I jump out of bed. I'm in my polka dotted green American Eagle boxers because American Eagle boxers were in at the time. Obviously, I go running out in the backyard and I'm trying to put this fire out. I mean, it's a huge shed, you know, it's 10 by 20. And I mean, all that's left is the frame of the shed at this point. The whole thing's on fire. I'm so close to it that I'm burned the next day because I'm only in my underwear again. And I'm trying to put it out with a kinked fire hose, or I mean a kinked water hose that I can't really process is kinked. I just know that there's not very much water coming out. And I don't know what I'm trying to do. It's like the size of this entire center row here. I'm trying to put it out with a, with a kinked water hose. And so long story short, the whole thing burns down. All of my dad's nice bikes are like a puddle of aluminum at this point, it just melted everything. And uh, thankfully the fire department showed up. And what had, what had happened was, my, when I was taking the logs out, there was one that got away from me. And so it rolled underneath the, the shed and sat there for four or five hours and then caught the whole thing on fire. And so thankfully my neighbor ran over. I don't know how she got in still to this day. Like how did she end up in my room? It's one of the most confusing things that can happen to you at 4 a.m. And uh, so, so I say all that to say because there was a specific way to put the fire out. Like there's a specific way that you do things and you don't get to do them your way. And so that leads us into the first point that God has a specific way of doing things as well. So going into Exodus 26, 11 through 25, now bear with me, this is going to seem a little bit, uh, a little bit like a strange passage, but we'll cover that at the end. So you shall make 50 clasps of bronze and put the clasps into the loops and, comp- and couple the tent together that it may be a single hole and the part that remains of the curtains of the tent, the half the curtain that remains shall hang over the back of the tabernacle. And the extra that remains in the length of the curtains, the cubit on the one side and the cubit on the other side, shall hang over the sides of the tabernacle on this side and on that side to cover it. And you shall make for the tent a covering of tanned ram skins and a covering of goat skins on top. You shall make upright frames for the tabernacle of acacia wood. Ten cubits shall be the length of a frame and a cubit and a half the breadth of each frame. There shall be two tenons in each frame for fitting together. So shall you do for all the frames of, a tab- of, uh, of the tabernacle." You shall make the frames for the tabernacle, 20 frames for the south side, and 40 bases of silver you shall make under the 20 frames, two bases under one frame for its two tenons, and two bases under the next frame for its two tenons. And for the second side of the tabernacle, on the north side, 20 frames, and for their, for, uh, and their 40 bases of silver, two bases under one frame, two bases under the next frame. And for the rear of the tabernacle, westward, you shall make six frames. You shall make two frames for corners of the tabernacle in the rear. They shall be separate beneath, but joined at top. At the first ring, thus shall it be with both of them. They shall form the two corners and there shall be eight frames with their bases of silver, 16 bases, two bases under one frame and two bases under another frame. 
So what's the, the point of all this? That seems kind of like an obscure passage, doesn't it? Like, you know, <laughs> this is going to be an exciting sermon going forward. Well, the point is today we're actually learning how to build a tabernacle. This is actually a live recording of a how-to video. We've actually got some tools, you know, Lincoln Logs in the back, Legos. We'll get back there. And uh, when I put that joke together, I was imagining you guys laughing much harder about that than you did. <laughs> it was much funnier to me when I thought of it, but, uh, but, but apparently not. So we'll, we'll just move, move on from that. But, but the point is, all throughout Exodus, Leviticus... And numbers, we, we see that God has a really specific way of doing things. You know, we see from the way the tabernacle is built to the how we, we offer sacrifice to God, how we atone for our sins. Like God is really specific and has specific ideas that he wants, uh, wants us to follow. And so the Hebrew word for tabernacle is mishkan, which literally means dwelling place. So the tabernacle was God's dwelling place. And so the Old Testament tabernacle was where God dwelled so that we could experience him. But today... Our heart is God's tabernacle. We are God's dwelling place. And so that makes a big difference when we read 1 Corinthians 6, 19 through 20. It says, Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you are bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. So the way we build our lives is vitally important, especially if we want God to be in them. Just like God laid out a plan for his tabernacle, he's also laid out a plan for each of our lives so that we can experience him more deeply. He's determined a specific pattern for each of us to live by. Romans 12, 2 says, do not be conformed to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that by testing, you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. And that pattern is, is dramatically different from the world's pattern. And that pattern that God's calling us to do, it can't be found in culture. It can't be found anywhere else in our world. It can only be found in God's word. And so if we're looking to find ways to tr be transformed by the renewing of, your, of our mind, the only place we can go is God's word. The only way to push back against a culture that's constantly drawing our affections away from God and to his creation, we're constantly being taught to worship God's creation rather than God himself. And so how do we know what God's plan is? How do we know how we should build our, our, our lives for God? Well, Psalm 119, 11 says, I have stored up your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. So the way we move forward in, in, in fighting against sin in our own lives and fighting into the will, fighting for God's will in our lives is that we have to store up his word in our heart. There's, there's no other way of doing it. We, we study God's word. We allow the Holy Spirit to work, to work with us through the word. And that's how we ultimately find a way to, to accomplish God's will in our lives. So we know his plan by spending time in our Bibles. We know by pouring over his word. And so um, I, I know a common question is like, well, how do I know what God's will for my life is? And that's a, obviously a, a seemingly really ominous question. And one person said, how do I know the will of God for the rest of my life? By knowing his will for the next 15 minutes. And that's something that's always stuck with me, knowing his will for the next 15 minutes. We all know what we can figure out for the next 15 minutes. When we leave here, we know how we should treat people, how we should act, the things that we should say, the things that we're supposed to think about, the, the, the way that we honor people. Like, that's a really simple way to figure out God's will for our lives. God oftentimes doesn't give us this map that's years into the future. He just says, honor me in the next 15 minutes, and then I'll accomplish my will for your life over the, over the course of it. And so we know that all he's ever calling us to do is follow him in minute by minute. How, how we, again, how we should treat people, conduct our speech, conduct our friendships, all those principles are in the Bible, and we don't need a degree in theology or some divine word from the sky to tell us how to do it. You know, I think we always look for, I'm just trying to figure out what God's will for my life. It's like, man, it's, it's pretty simple. Love God, love people, fight your sin, you know? And we all know what those sins are for us day by day. What are those major sins? We all have the things that as soon as I mention the word sin, I have my own things that I think of, and I think all of you do as well. But all of that, that what is really clear is that we don't get to do things our way. We, we don't get to make up our own real rules. If we truly want to experience God more deeply, we have to ask him how he wants us to build our lives. And so the rules apply to us. We like to think we can twist and turn and fit the rules into our logic system and, and, and our, our worldview. And we can define what God's doing by what we want. And God tells us that he wants order and it's not our order. You know, I'm a, I'm a little bit of a, a rebel by nature. I love to find rules that, that I decide to, don't apply to me. You know, I was, I was a terrible student in school. I freaking hated school, hated college. I went to, I'm an engineer now and absolutely hated, hated college. My roommates can attest to this. I, I, I went to class maybe 20% of the time. Genuinely, I probably went to each class maybe once a week. 
That was a thing that I, that I hated, never did it, never did homework, or at least I'd, I'd copy it, you know, and, and at least so, towards the end, you have to at least do that, you know, because you're going to get such bad grades that that's not going to work. But so I would kind of come in and, and, uh, study for the 36 hours leading up the test, 12 hours a day, read everything, learn everything and pass with about a B, you know, so that I could pass the class. And so I just kind of figured I had a good personality, I had a good resume, a lot of good work history. So the rules didn't really apply to me. I didn't need to work hard at school. That, that was not, that was not something that I really needed to be concerned with. And I, I used to curse all the time because I'm a, you know, I'm a legit Christian. I'm a solid guy. Like I'm, I'm, I'm real, you know? So like cursing, what's the big deal? You know, like rules really don't apply to me. And even the things that I did think the rules applied to me on like lust or pornography for so long, I thought, well, confessing and being honest with my brothers, I'm, I'm confessing, I'm being honest. Everybody knows about all this stuff. And because I was confessing, I thought, yeah, I mean, I fail. And I'm, I know that God is really, really displeased with this part of my life, but you know, at least I'm honest. So yeah, again, the rules don't really apply to me. And I just find that my past rebellion against God's rules has cost me so much of God. It's cost me so much time. And there was a time that God finally says it's time to submit. And God is calling us to follow his rules. God is calling us to follow his Bible and his word and his rules and his order for our lives and to stop deciding that we can do it our own way. But why does he do that? Does he, does he want to crack the whip on us? Does he want to frustrate us? Why does he make all these strict rules? Are the rules just to keep us tied down? Well, yeah, I think yes and no. The, the rules are there. The rules certainly keep us tethered in the same way that a kite string keeps a kite tethered. You know, the, the, the kite without the string, it's gone. It, it flows around for, a, for a, maybe a minute or two, and it crashes back down to, its, to an ash heap of insignificance. And I think that's often how we view God's rules. We're this kite up here and we're just annoyed by the string that's keeping us down, the string that really keeps us from really doing what we want to do. And I think that's where God can really transform our heart, where we change from wanting to do whatever we want to finally wanting to be tethered by God's laws. And God's parameters, our lives are there. Are they, they're the tether that, that keeps us crashing. They're, 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 in, our, they're in place for our own, for our own good. They're ultimately so we can experience him. They're never insignificant. They're never trivial. God doesn't give us rules to follow just because he wants to be entertained by us. They're always for our own good. God does everything to prosper us and never to harm us. I mean, do we ever look back on our parents, like giving us the rules of, you got to look both ways before, you're, before you cross the street and think, what a bunch of tyrants, you know, unbelievable. They're making us look both ways. I'm done with this. You know, I'm looking, I'm not looking anymore. I'm grown up. I'm a grown man. I'm not looking anymore. No, like they're always to prosper us and, and not to harm us. And, and God has the same specific way of doing things. And it's not until oftentimes later on when we look back and realize that, that God gave us this stuff for our own good. And so moving on to, to point number two, God decides his will for our lives and not us. Exodus 35, 30 through 35. Then Moses said to the people of Israel, see, the Lord is called by name Bezalel, the son of Uri, son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah. And he has filled him with the spirit of God, with skill, with intelligence, with knowledge, and with all craftsmanship to design artistic designs, to work in gold and silver and bronze, in cutting stones for setting and in carving wood, for work in every skilled craft. And he has inspired him to teach both him and Aholiab, the son of Ahasamach of the tribe of Dan. He has filled them with skill to do every work done by an engraver or by a designer or by an embroiderer in blue and purple and scarlet yarns and fine twined linen or by a weaver, by any sort of workman or skilled designer. And so I feel like God was saying two things here. First, he equipped certain people for specific tasks. Uh, he specifically said Bazilo would be the one to, to, to build the tabernacle. And there's other people that probably would have wanted to get in on that, but that's just not how God ordered it. That's, it was Bazilo who, who God chose. And that means that God, we, we have to get involved in the ways that God is calling us, specifically in the ways that he's gifted us. It says that he gifted Bazila with, with all these skills. And so anyone else trying to come in, it just becomes a distraction. It becomes frustrating for the people that are trying to help. It becomes distracting and, and frustrating for the people that God really called to do that. And I think oftentimes we, we, we get upset with the ways that God has gifted us because we get jealous or want to do something else. And we need to find the path, not that we think is most prestigious or what we find is the most status, but, but simply the path that we know that God has gifted us to walk. We need to look at the ways he's equipped us and find ways to serve with those gifts to meet the needs of other people. And so maybe you're great for care. Maybe you're great at caring for people like awesome, man. There's nothing better than having somebody around to comfort you when you're in a bind. Maybe you're a planner and great at helping people order their life. Great, man. Like there's no one better 
than somebody who can come around in the midst of chaos and start putting all the pieces together. And all of a sudden it seems ordered and everything's peaceful now. Maybe you're a great encourager, like amazing. There's, there's nothing better than having a friend that can build you up, encourage you, pump you up, and let you go out and get the job done. And maybe you're great at spending time with people and making them feel valued. Again, great. There's, there's nothing better than a friend that makes you feel significant and valued. And so I don't know what your gift is, but I think you probably do. And embracing your gifts and walking them in them is ultimately what will fulfill your life most and will honor God most. 1 Corinthians 12, 12 through 20 says, For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and we're all made to drink of one spirit. For the body does not consist of one member, but of many. Should the foot say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body? That would, not make any, that would not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would be the sense of hearing? If the whole body were an ear, where would be the sense of smell? But as it is, God arranged members of the body, each one of them, as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, but one body. And so God wants to use all of us together working towards his kingdom. That, that's really his plan and his goal for us is that we would all identify all of our gifts and we'd come together to, to work as this one machine, this one unit, which is the body of Christ, the church. Like that's what he's calling us to do, that we would find ways that some people are great for caring to people and some people are great at administration and some people are great at leadership and some people are great at speaking and some people are great at serving. Like all of these things come together to make an organization of the body of Christ that can truly serve people and truly honor God. And so <clears throat> he's wanting us to work, work all together. And the second thing I think that God was, was telling me here is that we need to obey God's call. We want so badly to do what we want in life. We want, we want the jobs for us that we want. We want the spouse that we want. We want, the, we want to live where we want. We always want to make decisions based on how we want things to go. But God has ordered our lives. God has specific things that he's calling us to do, specific things he's asking us to do, specific character traits he's asking us to possess, and specific areas, or areas of our lives that he's ordering and so if you consider what God would have your life look like, have you, have you even considered, hey, God, what, what, what do you think about this life decision? Have, have you ever asked God, God, I, here I am, I, I don't know, what, what do you think? A lot can be done in that time of just that little bit of waiting on God. Waiting on God doesn't mean that it's this thing of like, it's an, you know, this defined amount of time. Waiting on God is coming back to consider what God would say about what we're doing. Just a simple considering God's opinion. So because he's calling you to orient your life in a particular way, he's calling you to walk in a certain manner. He's calling you to spend time with quality friends, be involved in quality community of believers who will hold you accountable and raise the standards in your life. He's calling you to purity. He's calling you to sacrifice. And those will be influenced by who is ordering your life. If the Bible and God is ordering your life, then all of those things will be influenced one way. And if culture is ordering your life, then all of your friends and, and relationships and, and lifestyles will all be ordered that way. And so... We have to do what God is calling us to do. And God didn't ask Bazila what he wanted to do. God told Bazila what he would do. This wasn't up to Bazila. And just like it's not up to Bazila, it's not up to us. We don't get to decide. God does. And Bazila could have done his own thing. He could have gone off and decided, no, I don't want to build the tabernacle. I want to do something else. And would have been significantly less fulfilled. And he would have never got the honor of doing what God had called him to do here and gotten the honor of building the tabernacle. So we don't get to ask God. We don't get to ask God to join what we're doing. We look for what God is doing and join him there. I think so often we want God to come into what we're doing. We ask God to come into our relationships. We ask God to come into our workplace. We ask God to come into our jobs, our relation, everything, our family, instead of orienting our life and saying, okay, God, where are you? And that's where I want to be. I want to be there. I want to be where you are instead of doing my own thing and asking you to follow along. And so God has called and gifted each of us for a part in his plan, but we'll never taste it if we don't consider what he would have us do. Point number three, God resides only in his will and his way. So Exodus 36, 17 through 30, and he made 50 loops on the edge of the outermost curtain on the one set and 50 loops on the edge of the other connecting curtain. And he made 50 clasps of bronze to couple the tent together that it may be a single hole. And he made for the tent a covering of tanned ram skins and goat skins. Then he made the upright frames for the tabernacle of acacia wood. Ten cubits was the length of a frame, and a cubit and a half the breadth of each frame. Each frame had two tenons for fitting together. He did this for all the frames of the tabernacle. The frames for the tabernacle he made thus. 
20 frames for the south side, and he made 40 bases of silver under the 20 frames, two bases under the one frame for its two tenons, and two bases for the next, under the next frame for its two tenons. For the second side of the tabernacle on the north side, he made 20 frames and their 40 bases of silver, two bases under one frame and two bases under the next frame. For the rear of the tabernacle westward, he made six frames. He made two frames for corners of the tabernacle in the rear, and they were separate beneath but joined at the top at the first ring. He made two of them this way for the two corners, and there were eight frames with their bases of silver, 16 bases under each frame, two bases. And so I know that seems kind of repetitive, like, didn't we just repeat Exodus 26? That might have sounded really similar because it, it was, like, that, that was a, it's a direct repeat. So why did God repeat that? And I think he repeated that because he's trying to show us that the tabernacle is now being built the exact way that he said that it should be. He's now documenting that Azilo is doing it the exact way that he would ask to do it. And so you can, we, we can all build the tabernacle however we want. We can build it to whatever dimension we want, knowing that the tabernacle is our lives. We can make our, we can make our tabernacle out, out, of, out of 48 clasps instead of 50 clasps because all that, all that matters is the curtains are hung, right? Like who cares? We don't need the frames to be 10 cubits. We can make the frames eight cubits. We can build it almost the way God would have it to be. <clears throat> but the problem is, is that where God, gives, where God doesn't give specific instructions then yeah, he gives us freedom to interpret and determine through his word how we do things. But if there is a clear instruction, it matters. And so you can build that tabernacle however you want. You can build your ministry however you want. You can build your life however you want. You can make all your decisions to fit your kingdom. You can make 48 class instead of 50 again. You can make the, ten, t- the, the, the tenons eight cubits instead of 10 because it's hard to go find wood that that's, th- that's that straight. And then you could get milled up to 10. You're saying, God, I mean, this is okay, right? Like this is really hard to find 10 cubit long wood. So eight will probably work, right? And we can build our whole lives and our whole ministry this way. And everyone on the outside can look at this tabernacle and think that's a great tabernacle. That's a godly tabernacle because they're not going to know. The people in our lives, they're not going to know what, how, how close the tabernacle is. For the majority of people in our lives, they just see what it looks like on the outside. And so people would come to a tabernacle that was 48, had 48 gold rings instead of 50. And they would come to a tabernacle that had eight um, the, the, the tenons were eight cubits instead of 10 cubits. Surely we can have people enter into that ministry and we can partially do what God's calling us to do. We can structure our lives however we want. We can give, partially give up the things that God's calling us to give up. We can partially follow God's will. We can partially follow his rules and we can build our lives however we want. Truly, you, you can. We, we can do that all day long. We can block pornography from, from your phone, but leave the social media sites that are eating your lunch because it's like, oh, I just don't really want to go there. You can hang out with mostly good friends, and, but still go drinking with your high school buddies on the weekend occasionally because you don't really want to cut those guys off. You can, you can do that. You can mostly say no, but occasionally go out and party. You can do whatever you want. You can build your life however you want. And it will look like a tabernacle. If you're coming here and we can come and play the church game, if we're coming here and, 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 and fellowshipping with other believers, it can look really, really good. But, and all the other people can come around to this, but there's one person who won't, and it'll be God. God won't be in it. You can build the tabernacle however you want, but if you want God in it, you will build it according to him. God, God came into all of our lives. If, if God has come into your life, he came into you as you were. God accepted you as you were, but he will not move in your life as you were. If you want God to move in your life, it's going to require us to order and structure our houses according to him. And so that means getting rid of everything in the house, throwing it all out so that God can come in and start building something new, or he can come in and start throwing it out and give all of us a panic attack. So you really have two options. You can either bow now by choice, or you can be forced to bow later, but God does require our surrender. If we're going to change, become more like him, he requires us to build our lives on him, on his standards, on his statutes, on his commandments. So Exodus 40, 34 through 38, then the cloud covered the tent of meeting and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. And Moses was not able to enter the tent of meeting because the cloud settled on it. And the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle throughout all their journeys. Whenever the cloud was taken up from the tabernacle, the people of Israel would set out. But if the cloud was not taken up, then they did not set out the next day or till the day that it was taken up for the cloud of the Lord was on the tabernacle by day and fire was in it by night in the sight of all, uh, all the house of Israel throughout their journeys. So again, why now did God come into the tabernacle? Was it, was it because the Israelites had no sin? Was it because they were righteous because they had everything together and they were always faithful and they always had every little detail of their life squared away? No, no, it was because they built the tabernacle, right? It's because they built the foundation, right? 
And so are there going to be little details that they mess up? Or sometimes the curtain's going to blow away and that's going to screw things up and they're going to have to figure that out? Are they sometimes going to make their sacrifices incorrectly? Yeah, that's going to happen. But if the foundation's not built correctly, God can't come into it. And so we're going to make mistakes, you bet. Are you going to go back to your sin at times? With 100% certainty, you will. But if your life's built on a foundation according to God's, then he will come in and he will continually straighten your paths and align your heart with his. 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 3, 11 through 15. For no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become manifest for the day will disclose it because it will be revealed by fire. And the fire will, fire will test what sort of work each one has done. If the work that anyone has built on the foundation survives, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, though he himself will be saved, but only as through fire. And that, that passage just kind of goes back to the, the, the initial story of, of the fire deal, you know, when, when, I had, when I had burned the shed down. It's really weird kind of going over this thing the last week and just realizing, like, I haven't thought about this story in a long time, and it was so long ago. But that could have burned my whole neighborhood down. I mean, depending on when the fire department got there, like that could have burned everything down. That could have killed my family. That could have killed my neighbor's family. That could have killed me. You know, I'm out there, there's propane bottles exploding, flying by my head. And I'm here with a little kinked water hose trying to put out this massive engulfed fire in my life. I'm just standing here like an idiot trying to get it done. And so... Later, we found out, like I said, that the log had rolled underneath the, uh, rolled underneath the fire because I didn't want to put it out. I wanted to have another fire the next day. I wanted to get mostly everything out, but I wanted to preserve it so I could come back to it. I wanted to just come back to it later. And I just felt like God was saying, what sin? What, what is it? What is it in your life that you've, you've almost put out, that you've almost put aside? What, what is it there that you're, that you're hanging on to, not fully dousing it? I should have, put every, should have left everything in the fire pit and just soaked it but I didn't because I wanted to come back to it. And so what part of our lives, what part of our lives are we leaving there? And I just want to warn you, like it can all burn down. You can choose to put it out now and you might not put it out and it goes out on its own later and you get lucky, but more than likely one rolls away and gets away from you. You don't notice and it rolls underneath the shed. And next thing you know that everything's burning and you have no ability to fight it on your own. You have no ability to fix it. You're just stuck with a little dinky half-kinked water hose doing nothing, just standing there about to, could have gotten killed at any moment by these explosions that were happening in there. And so you know what? At the end of that, what ended everything was the fire department showed up. And there I am trying to put it out and they say, get out of the way. And in two minutes it's out and everything's safe and it's all done. Now the fact of the matter is the rubble was still there, but just like in 1 Corinthians, the foundation was still there. The foundation was still there. Now all it required was just to build back on top of it. And so maybe you're in that place where in, in your life. Maybe you're in the spot where you could still put this out. You could still do it. You could still douse this thing. Whatever the thing is that hasn't blown up in your face yet, hasn't burned your whole life down yet, you can stop that now. But rest assured, if you do not, it will burn everything down. And there's a guarantee because God says if you're in him, he will burn it down. He will burn it down. The day will test it. And so maybe you're there, and I just encourage you to put it out, douse it. It's time to get rid of it. Be done with it forever. Whatever that sin is, whatever that struggle is, be done with it forever and never come back. And then maybe you, maybe you're in the side of it is burned down, and you're sitting there trying to put out this fire, trying to put out this, this problem that you created. You know it's your fault, and you're stuck. There is no answer within yourself. There, there is no way forward in your own strength. There is no way forward doing it the way that God, outside of how God would have you do it. You can't put it out with the little fire hose or with the little water hose. It wouldn't have mattered if it wouldn't have been kinked. The thing was engulfed. And maybe that's some of you guys right now looking around like, man, I've been trying to put this out and I just can't get it done. And you're right, you can't. And so it's time to get rid of it once and for all. It's time to call the fire department and it's time, to, it's time to have them douse it. Call in the one who can fix this. God can fix this. He can put it all out and you can start back over and you can build your tabernacle the way he would have you do it. There's hope in this. Life's not over. 
we're all under 35 here. We can all, we can all figure out what's, what, what's going on with life. We can get this squared away with God. It's not over. There's a whole lot left here that God's trying to have us do. And so it's time to build our tabernacle to our, to our dimensions. And first, that comes with putting it out, put the fire out so we can rebuild in the right way. And we can push and strive and fight and claw to put things together in our own wisdom, our own strength, and our own dimensions. But God will not come in until we've stepped it back, stepped back from everything and said, okay, God, I'll build it your way. Okay, God, I'll let you put the fire out. And so I hope that we go forward this week and start looking at ways that we can start building our tabernacle according to God's will and put the fire out the way that he would have us put it out. I'll pray for us. Dear God, I'm so thankful for this group of people. I'm so thankful for all the work that you've done in all of our lives. So so thankful for your Holy Spirit moving here and convicting and drawing and and, uh, giving us the ability to just experience you, period. Even when we build it the wrong way, God, even when we build it the wrong way, you're still there to help us rebuild it. Even when we've burned everything down, God, you're still there to help us put it out and rebuild. And I pray that you would encourage any of us here that are feeling low after this, that you would come in and comfort any of us that are feeling that way and remind us that that you're not done in our lives, that you're not done working for us, you're not done working in us, and that you still have a future and a hope for us, plans to prosper us and not to harm us. God, we're thankful for everything you do. In Jesus' name, amen.